before introducing today's speaker, I wanted to mention one announcement. This coming Tuesday at 1.30 in the Noise Building, there's something called Launch Lunch. Launch Lunch is a great opportunity for anyone that's got an idea for a business and a desire to be involved in entrepreneurship in any way to come and join with peers, have a bite to eat, and discuss your business ideas. So there's just, it's about an hour, it's from 1.30 to 2.20, I believe, in the Noise Building. I will send a message or post an announcement on Canvas for all of you so that you can see that and uh, consider it. If I were you, I would couple that opportunity with the Opportunity Quest business competition that is coming up. Um, we'll actually be at the launch lunch talking about some things you can do to enhance your entry in the Opportunity Quest business competition. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Mr. Zach Smith. Zach Smith is a serial entrepreneur. He's, he says he's never had a real job in his life. And uh, I think that's because he just has this in his blood, likes to start a business and work for himself. And that is probably what led to his founding of co-founding, he does have a partner, uh, in Funded Today, America's leading crowdfunding marketing agency. You'll remember at the opening of this semester, I featured his company um, f as one of the few that I thought you'd really like. So. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to just listen close, learn a lot from him. He graduated at the, as a valedictorian from uh, Weber State University's Goddard School of Business and Economics with a degree uh, specializing in accounting, and he's also fluent in Mandarin. Uh, they, in his company, have raised millions of dollars for various crowdfunding campaigns. In 2011 and 2014, under his leadership, the company received third place at the prestigious Utah 25 competition. And last week's presenter was Jeanette Bennett. Remember her company, Bennett Communications, publishes Utah Business Magazine. He was also featured in Utah Business Magazine. He is the co-author of the upcoming book, Funded, and the co-founder of Crowdcom Virtual, the world's first and biggest virtual crowdfunding summit. He lives in South Ogden, Utah, and enjoys playing indoor soccer, basketball, table tennis, and working out. Please welcome Mr. Zach Smith. Thank you. All right. So I'm really excited to be here today. So this is the first time I've ever been in Ephraim, Snow College. It's a nice area. Pretty cold though. Is, that, is it like this inside and outside? <laughs> Today I want to chat about exactly this title here. I decided to be specific. I used to say 150 million, but I looked at our website last night and we're at 159 million four hundred ninety-two thousand four hundred ninety-five dollars raised. Twenty-one lessons learned along the way. Before I get started though, I want to talk to you guys about a serial entrepreneur. Anybody ever heard of that term? Everybody's probably heard of entrepreneur, but what about serial? Not the serial killer type, but the type of person that is completely and utterly focused on entrepreneurship. Multiple ventures. In the blood, like he said. That's what, we, that, that, that's what I believe in. And I believe that if you're a serial entrepreneur, you're an individual who, rather than working as an employee, runs small businesses and assumes all the risks and rewards of these given ven business ventures, ideas, and goods and services offered for sale. And I changed this one too because a serial entrepreneur doesn't, doesn't just stop at one venture. They don't stop at two. They don't stop at three. You can have multiple businesses. You can have lots of success. I'm going to specifically talk about Funded Today, my most successful business so far. But I believe a serial entrepreneur never stops. Before I get into these lessons, I want to spend just a little bit talking about how I learned these lessons. And that's the story of Funded Today. So. I was a lot like all of you, not too long ago even. And that's something I want to chat about. I believe that the economy, the world that we live in nowadays, is such that time doesn't matter that much. Age doesn't matter that much. Speed is so easy to accomplish. And you can do great things in short amounts of times. You don't have to be the 65-year-old success story that sells their company for $500 million to Amazon or Walmart and retires, you can be the 30-year-old serial entrepreneur who has similar success. I think you can do that. And that's how I was. I was like you. I, was, I even took a class just like this at Weber State. 
one of my favorite classes. People would come in and they would tell their amazing stories, and it was inspiring. I was sitting there, I was like, oh man, how did they do it? They must be special, they must be different. And it motivated me, and it got me going. I came home from a two-year LDS mission in Toronto, Canada. It's where I learned how to speak Mandarin as well. And I saw somebody who was a mentor of mine. And he had been really successful in the time that I was away. And one conversation led to another conversation. And ultimately, he said, hey, come on over. He had a really, he kind of had the typical Instagram glamour sort of lifestyle that you would look into. And it, it, it kind of excited me at a, as a younger age. And I said, what are you doing? How did you do it? He said, come on over, I'll show you. One day led to two, two days led to a month, a month led to six months. Suddenly he and I are starting a business together and it's really successful, such that it made millions of dollars. And I had my first taste of what you can do on the internet in terms of making a lot of money. I didn't like that business though, and so a year or so more passed and I took the lessons I learned from that business and I started a consulting firm. That consulting firm was called Start Doing Business. Startdoingbusiness.com actually still exists. And what I did is I worked with people. Worked with people from all over the world. And it grew. Because of the lessons I learned in that first business, I was able to apply them to a broader marketplace. And I taught people what I did in that business for their businesses. Paid media marketing, affiliate marketing, email marketing, all those sorts of things. And that's what Start Doing, doing Business became. Problem was, I had, I, simultaneous to all this, I was still going to school. I was a college student just like all of you. And so my time was pretty limited. And so I build by the hour on retainer, kind of like an accountant or an attorney would do. So I would say I'm $250 an hour, and I would just log my hours. I ran into a client, though, that said, hey, we have this amazing idea. It's wonderful. It's going to impact runners and marathon runners, and it's going to do all this good. We've already done some good things with it. Check it out. Problem is, I can't afford your fee. We're a mom and pop shop out of South Ogden, Utah. We don't have any money. And they were, they were a little older too, probably in their 50s, 60s at the time. And they said, have you heard of this thing called crowdfunding? Truth be told, I hadn't. Never heard of crowdfunding. How many of you have heard of crowdfunding? Just a show of hands. Good. I love speaking to younger audiences because I don't have to explain crowdfunding. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how, how hard it's like, wait, is that like Shark Tank? It's like, no, it's a, little different than, it's a little different than Shark Tank. They just get confused. Well, I was confused though. Not too long ago, I didn't know what crowdfunding was. And so I went on the internet and I started researching. And I looked at kind of like the history of crowdfunding. Has anybody ever heard of the story of the granite base for the Statue of Liberty? France sent us over the Statue of Liberty and we didn't have a base to set it up. And nobody wanted to fund it. Well, this guy named Joseph Pulitzer, you might have heard of him, he had a pretty influential newspaper. He decides to empower the masses. And he got hundreds of thousands of donations to the tune of nearly $6.3 million in today's money to raise money for the base of the Statue of Liberty. And that got me excited. I looked into crowdfunding historically, and then I looked at the Medici family, who kind of inspired the Renaissance and empowered artists like Da Vinci and Leonardo and Botticelli. And I said, wow, this is exciting. This is cool. I can't believe what Kickstarter and Indiegogo are doing. I want to be part of it. And so I took their idea. These are some of the most recent prototypes. I always forget to bring them, so this presentation I brought them. These were some of the most original Bruce Forts. That second graphic down there at the bottom that were made. It's a running wallet. Attaches, snap. Anybody heard of the Bruce Fort? Okay, yeah. It's famous. It's internationally famous now. It's a multi-million dollar company. I, if you actually stick it in, you go all the way in, but I'm not going to do that. But Hold your keys, credit card, wallet. Those are some of the prototypes that they gave me. And we ran with it. We started a crowdfunding campaign. And 35 days later, this mom and pop shop, through my help and the help of my business partner, who we'll talk about later, raised $115,000. And the Roost Board was born. They had capital. And not only capital, they had validation that they had a good idea. Because the money I raise is different than the angels, the venture capitalists, the rich uncle, the rich dad who just give you money for an idea, whether or not it's good or not. What I do is I raise money for ideas through validation. And that money being raised is actual pre-orders for products that people want. And Funded Today was essentially born. That story led to hundreds of others. Everybody wanted to know how this little running wallet raised 115 grand in 35 days. They looked at the charts, they looked at the data. It was one of the most successful attachables wallets of the time back then. 
And so everybody wanted to hire us. And over the years, we've been responsible for quite a few success stories. I kind of listed a bunch of them out. One other fact, we have raised more money for more million dollar campaigns than anybody in the world. And we've raised more money than any other agency or person for more products than anybody in the world. Our system works, our process works, it's tried and true, and it's du duplicatable, if that's a word. The only one I wish I would have brought is the Valvax travel jacket, because it's freezing in here today. <laughs> but everything that I am wearing, head to toe, is something we raise money for. Original grain watch, silver air shirt, track line belt, McMacular pants, silver air socks, Wilcox boots. Do I have my basics wallet? Yes, I have my basics wallet. <laughs> it's been exciting. And that's one of the most exciting parts of my business is looking at all these amazing ideas that maybe started out as napkins or prototypes and come to life. We got famous for it. Became internationally renowned, got a bunch of press. And like I said, I updated my presentation last night to reflect the amount we've raised. Maybe it's gone up since then. We keep a running total. If you're ever bored, go to funded.today, refresh the page, and you can watch the money come rolling in for all the campaigns we raise money for. No further ado, 21 lessons learned along the way. Normally when I give a presentation, I talk about specific strategies and things we've done and what we do to raise the money, but I wanted to go a little bit more bigger picture, higher level today, to kind of show you that I'm not that much different than you. Not too long ago, literally less than 10 years ago, I was sitting in these seats, didn't have a lot of money, didn't have a rich dad or a rich mom or any rich family members, nobody wanted to give me money, but I had a burning, I had a thriving, I had a desire, I had something in my heart that made me think I could do something in this world, that I could make change. And I think if you guys apply these lessons to your life, you'll be able to expedite the process that I've been able to figure out pretty quickly as well. Lesson number one. And I loved in the introduction that he actually said, entrepreneurship is in the blood. Because that is exactly what I believe. And that's okay. If you're not an entrepreneur and if you're sitting here thinking, Ooh, this sounds stressful, this sounds crazy, I'm speaking up in front of people, I don't know if I can sell my ideas, I don't know if I can pitch, I don't know if I can do that. Maybe that's somebody else's thing. Hey, that's perfectly fine. We have a lot of people in our company who make a lot of money, who have great livings, good family lives, good work-life balance, and we need them. If everybody were like me, it might be a little crazy. Entrepreneurship's in the blood, and that's okay. From a very early age, I was extremely entrepreneurial. At the time, I didn't even define the word. I think I didn't even define entrepreneurship, believe it or not, until in college. I don't know why, I just didn't consider myself an entrepreneur. I thought I was gonna be an accountant. I was going to school for accounting. I thought I'd go on to law school. I thought I'd become a lawyer in a big practice or practice in the big four accounting firms. Those were kind of my aspirations and my dreams. I didn't even realize it. All along, I was an entrepreneur. I was the guy who would sell lemonade and then I would sell snow cones and then I'd go to soccer tournaments and I'd drag my radio flyer wagon along with me and sell the snow cones. And then once I figured out the process, I'd enlist my four brothers to help me in do sales and teach them how to do what I did. And it was fun. And, and then I started a landscaping business. And my business partner was the same way. Entrepreneurship is in the blood. You have to love to create. You have to love what you do. You have to have a passion. You have to think it's fun. I tell my company all the time, our name's funded today. It's got fun in it. It's a new thing that we're kind of going with. I love what I do. It's play for me. And I'm not just telling you that. I could work all day, every day, and it wouldn't even feel like work for me because I just love it. No joke. Lesson number two. And I tried to make these lessons applicable to you. I wanted to say, if I were sitting in your seat, what are the most powerful things I could tell you? What are the things you could take away and do? What made me who I am? Because like I said, when I think about myself, I'm like, eh, I'm just kind of a simple dude. I went to Weber State University, pretty good university. No different than Snow College though. Hardly anybody's heard of Weber State. You know, we've got Damian Lillard, I guess. That's our claim to fame. <laughs> So it's not like it's some amazing, crazy university like Stanford or Harvard or anything like that. My family didn't really have any money. We were pretty middle class growing up. My dad was a teacher, did some construction on the side. So what helped me do what I was able to do? And when I asked myself that question, this one came up. Voracious curiosity. And be a dream student. 
Voracious. What does that mean? That's like tenacious. That's like insatiable. You crave knowledge. A question that my business partner came up with, because he's the same way, what are you reading right now? What's in your library? Aside from your textbooks, what blog posts have you read? What are you researching? Where are you do what are you doing in your life to go down that rabbit hole and learn more? That's the question I like to ask myself. What's on your Audible playlist? Are you using Blink? Are you using Blinkist? Are you doing things like that? What are you reading? Every I, I just crave knowledge. I'd love to learn. Even if it's like the most random thing. I'm, I'm getting into fishing right now. Never got into it. But I was at Cabela's probably three or four nights ago for four and a half hours just talking to the sales guy. It was fascinating all the stuff that I learned about fishing. And then we became such good friends that he took me fishing on his boat yesterday. <laughs> Voracious curiosity. Be a dream student. What books are you reading today? What are you researching? In addition to your school, what are you doing? And then be a dream student. You can do what I did and get really good grades in school and help out a lot of people. I graduated summa cum laude. I was valedictorian. And I did all the stuff I'm telling you about while this was happening. And I'm no different than you. You can do the same. It matters. Good writing, good grammar, good spelling, good communication, good sales practices, a good mind. They all matter. And one last thing. Ryan Holiday, because now you're overwhelmed. Oh, crap, i got to read, i got to do all this stuff. What am I going to do? Ryan Holiday came up with something called an anti-library, and I love it. An anti-library is all the books you haven't read, all the things on your phone or your Kindle that you're looking at you haven't read yet. It reminds you of how much you don't know yet. And I love that. Buy the book. Erasmus, one of the most famous Dutch philosophers of the time, he said, I buy books when I have money. And when there is anything else left, I buy food and clothing. That's probably a little extreme, but he had some wonderful quotes and some wonderful insight and some powerful inspiration. I think we can be the same way. And learn the right things. I know that's hard to do, but it's so much harder to unlearn something wrong than it is to learn the best knowledge, the right things, right off the bat. Ask a lot of questions. Figure things out. Don't immediately believe the first thing posted on Facebook. If somebody says something, read it, research it, and then go down that rabbit hole and figure things out so that you are learning the right things so that your breadth of knowledge is wide enough that you are learning the right things, so you don't have to unlearn the wrong things later. Voracious curiosity. Lesson number three, find a mentor and work for a good boss. Now you might be saying, Zach, in your introduction, you said you're a serial entrepreneur and you've never had a real job your entire life and never worked for anybody. How does this one apply to you? That's why I added in the mentor part. If you never have a boss, you better have mentors. And I did not do this alone. My business partner, Thomas Albert, is at least worth 50% of what happened to Fund It Today, if not more. All of my mentors along the way, all the lessons I learned, all the people I connected with, we were just having some questions in our business that were pretty high level. And I have a Rolodex of probably 20 or 30 people that I rely on that have been really successful, some more successful than me, some less, but all a certain degree of success and lots of different life and business experiences. And I sent them an email and I said, hey, we're dealing with this right now, this specific problem. I wrote them a really long email, probably took me 20 or 30 minutes to write. And I sent the same one out to every single one of them. Here's what we're dealing with. Have you ever dealt with this? I think you have. Is there any advice you give me? What would you recommend? And they came back with amazing feedback. One guy, he's one of my mentors from the United Kingdom. He's good friends with John Henry, who owns the Boston Red Sox. He, he probably spent two and a half hours writing these emails. 12 pages, took me an hour to read the dang thing. But I was like, oh my gosh, this is so impressive. James, thank you so much. Like, if you could have a, if you could have a mentor, if you can build those relationships, if you can find those people and then foster those connections, it matters so much. And then when you need help, you can call on them and they're going to help you. And you're going to get the sort of wisdom and advice from them that I received from some of my mentors. And if you are working for somebody, which is perfectly fine, I think in hindsight it would have been good for me to work at a fast food place and learn systems and processes or work somewhere at a call center. All those things I think are pretty good. But find a good boss. How do you find a good boss? You ask some people that are working there. Do you like working here? Is your boss good? Ask a few. Get statistical significance. Don't just rely on one. Ask four or five people. You like working and get their feedback, and then if they all say, yeah, this is a really good place, it's not bad, work there, because you probably have a good boss. Lesson number four, 
Connection is everything. And this one ties right in line with the last one. Who you know matters. It really does. Almost everything I've been able to accomplish is because I knew somebody. My business partner, Thomas Alver, is a good example of connection is everything. For probably three and a half to four years before, we st before I started Funded Today, I was talking with Thomas. And originally, he had a post for like an advertisement or something on the internet that said, hey, I know how to do this. And it showed that he lived in Cedar Hills, Utah. So me, voracious curiosity, said, who's this guy? He sounds pretty smart. And I networked with him. And I found him on Facebook. I went, did some Google searching, stalking him or whatever. And I said, hey, how you doing? I'm Zach Smith. Hey, what's up, Zach? I said, I saw this thing on the internet. What do you think about it? He's like, oh, that's so funny you brought it up. One day led to two. Two days led to a year. A year led to two years. Two years led to four years. And we never even did anything together. We just talked, networked, discussed, connected. And then midway through the Roosport campaign, actually 67% of the way through the Roosport campaign, I'd raised about 50,000 bucks on my own. I brought Thomas on, and he helped raise an additional $70,000 or more in one-third the amount of time. But it was four years in the making. I tell this story quite often when I give this sort of a presentation. My sister-in-law, she is going to university, Utah Valley University right now, and she's getting a degree in communications and PR. And great, good for her. She wants to do something in the fashion industry. And I told her, I said, Rachel, in addition to getting your degree, just imagine if by the time you graduate in three or four years, if you are friends with the top 500 fashion bloggers in the world, all the biggest fashion blogs, all the biggest fashion sites. And she's like, well, how do I do that? And I said, simple, go on Twitter. Retweet everything they say. Comment on every post they say. Balance it out. Do it naturally. Really read what they say. If they write an article about a fancy new dress, talk about how you love the dress and you love how they describe the dress this way. And by the time you've done that 10 or 15 times, you're going to be the only person in the world that has done that. And they're going to say, who's this person? Who's this interesting person? And then you'll say, hey, I really love what you're doing. I'm going to be in your city this time this year. Can I take you out for lunch? or you connect with them on Facebook, like I did with Thomas. And by the time she does this, if, she, if she's able to connect with the 500 biggest fashion bloggers in the world, and we work with tons of fashion, right? Like my whole entire wardrobe today is fashion things we've created. She comes to me and she says, Zach, I am friends with the 500 biggest websites in the world that are directly related to fashion. I li I'd like a job. I'm hiring her in a heartbeat, and I'm not even looking at anything else on the resume because of her connections because of who she knows, because of what she's able to do. Zach, I know all these people, and they will write about anything I ask them to do. This is hard work, right? I'm asking her to spend her four years in college getting a degree, but also becoming best friends with everybody in fashion. But if you do that for four years, you're going to have an amazing 50, 60 years after, and you're going to get any job you want. And if you want to start your own business, you have a pretty dang good setup when it comes to anything in fashion. Or whatever you want to do, you can apply this to anything. Lesson number five. Just go for it. Fell fast. Fun of today's story is abbreviated. I told you I was going to tell you a lot of stories and a lot of lessons along the way. Such it is with Funded Today. When we funded the Roost Fort, guess what I did? I went back to doing my consulting. And guess what Thomas did? He went back to doing his political advertising in the Deep South for senators and some presidential campaigns. But we started to get a lot of people wanting to hire us. One of those people was a company out of Orlando, Florida called Freeways. And they had a goal of $300,000 for some pretty cool headphones they were raising. Catch was there was only five days left and they needed to raise $120,000 more. They'd only raised $180,000 of their $300,000 goal. If you know anything about Kickstarter, it's all or nothing funding. Meaning if we didn't raise them $120,000 in five days, all that 180 grand's gone. If we raise them 120,000 more, then now they have 300,000 dollars to play with. I was pretty conservative, even though I had probably had a lot more success with business than Thomas, and he was still kind of up and coming. He was like, "Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's do it." And I was like, "Ah, man, that's going to take a lot of money to spend. I don't know. Should we do it?" In the end, he went for it. He gave me like a finder's referral fee because it was kind of my business, and he made it happen. In five days, he raised them $325,000. You can see the spike right there. 
fell fast. You're all young. I look out in the audience and I would guess you're probably all younger than me. I'm 30 years old. At a young age, you can fell fast. You can take risks. You can do so much more so quickly. If that were to fail, it would have sucked. We probably would have lost 20, 30,000 bucks or something. But I would have helped him out. Thomas knew that I was there to cover him. It was a calculated risk. The number said we could get there. We had success one time, so we hadn't proven the model, but we knew it could probably work. But he took the risk, and he got a huge dividend for it. And I love that picture. That's Jackie Robinson, stealing home base on Yogi Berra. He led the league two years in stills in the National League. He was an all-star for six years. He took risks. He would have been called out, and he would have got a bat again. You can fail fast. I think, I think of myself sometimes like, I'm, I'm old, but really, I'm only 30. I could still fail fast. I could still apply this lesson. You can take risks, and if they don't work, you can take another risk. You can be calculating those risks. You don't have to be stupid. You can talk to people. You can network. You can figure out if it makes sense, and then you can go for it. Risk a couple thousand dollars. Lose it, work hard, get it back, and do it again. If you do that enough, and if you do it right, and you follow these principles and lessons, I guarantee you're going to have some huge success. Going along with Phil Fast, these next couple sets of lessons are very similar. Lesson number six, one failure does not yourself a failure make. This is a case study within Funded Today. That belt is the, timber, the Timberline belt from a guy named Don Wilder. Don Wilder was a client of ours, and that belt honestly looks kind of similar to mine. You know, I mean, all belts look pretty similar. For some reason, though, nobody wanted to buy that belt. We did all of our tried and true marketing practices, and we have something called the seven P's, the promotional P for that product, the presentation P for that product, perhaps the pricing P for that product, did not work out, didn't raise any money. Don Wilder, though, did not say, oh man, I'm a failure, I'm terrible. Man, I better just quit. Instead, he went on Kickstarter. He read the comments of hundreds of campaigns. And he found out that everybody wanted a better laptop stand. And that's what he did. Within six months from that failure for a belt campaign, he launched the laptop stand and hired Funded Today. And we raised him over a half a million dollars in roughly 30 days from that campaign. And now he's a multi-millionaire and he's done the same process. Sometimes his products fail, sometimes they succeed. And he has a product line and a product mix that is impressive and admirable because he learned that just because one idea fails does not mean I'm a failure, does not mean the world hates me, just means that product, for one reason or another, was not wanted by the market at that time. And you can find another one and you can be successful. Lesson number seven, be committed to success, not your idea of success. This one's pretty important. A lot of people, even when they fell, Don Wilder could have taken that belt, he could have went down that rabbit hole for another year. He quit it immediately because he trusted our feedback. He trusted what we told him. He trusted what all of the backers said about not wanting his belt. But a lot of people that hire us, or a lot of people who don't, are like, no, I know this idea is great. I know it's great. It's not. You got to let go. Do not be attached to your first baby. Do not be attached to your first idea of success. Be attached to success. A lot of people, that, that picture on the right looks kind of weird, right? She's doing this kind of thing. What is that, right? That's the spine gym. Nobody really thought it was going to work. Even I remember looking at that like, that's weird. Are we sure we want to take this one on? They'd only raised like seven grand. The day they hired us, three days previous, they'd raised no money. Turned out the whole world wanted this thing. It's raised $1.5 million in county. And he's shipping in a couple weeks. Be attached to success, not whatever you think is your idea of success. Follow success and let the numbers control your emotional response that you're going to have as an entrepreneur or businessman. Lesson number eight. Success does not indicate future success. Failure does not indicate future failure. I joked about not bringing my Baobax travel jacket. The Baobax travel jacket is the sixth most funded crowdfunding campaign of all time. And Funded Today was responsible for most of that. This is Haral Sangavi and the Baobax travel jacket. Combined with Indiegogo, in addition to that 9.1 raise, it did over $13 million. We're all a genius, right? He invented the world's most amazing travel jacket. He's going to be so successful. He's the next Jeff Bezos. He's going to rule the world. 
Anybody ever heard of the wireless charging apparel? Not a hand? That's Haral Sangavi. That's the creator of the Baobab travel jacket. He, didn't, he couldn't even get any backers. And none of that 67 raised happened. He spent 50-something thousand dollars on his video. He spent $180,000 marketing the campaign. All of that money down the drain. He didn't follow the same processes and procedures that he did for the Baobab travel jacket. He kind of thought, hey, anything I touch turns to gold. Go with it. He didn't focus on validation. He didn't figure out what his customers wanted. And he launched something that nobody wanted. Lesson number nine, Pareto's principle of 80-20 works. Anybody ever heard of 80-20 before? OK, a few hands. A guy named Vilfredo Pareto invented it. He was looking at pea pods in his garden, and he noticed that 80% of all of the peas came from just 20% of all of his plants. And then he looked at Italy. And in Italy, he saw that 80% of all of the land ownership was owned by 20% of the people. And now, 80-20 is kind of applied everywhere. We use it in our business quite a bit. We ask ourselves, what is the 20% that we can do? What is the smallest amount of thing we can focus on that's going to yield 80% of our efforts? You see this all over the place <clears throat> with taxes, with business. In our business, 80% of our revenue every month comes from 20% of our successful, amazing clients. Our best people are in that 20%. Our best people, no matter who we hire and fire and how we continue to build our company, those same 20% seem to rise to the top. When you can recognize the patterns of 80-20, then you can make big picture decisions to help you work on your business instead of in your business, in the nitty gritty sort of things on your business. Focus on 80-20. It works, it matters. Recognize those patterns. At Funded Today, like I said, we always have this thought process. Anytime we create something new, is this 80-20? Wait, why are we doing this if it's taking up 80% of our time but it's only increasing revenue 20%? Stop. And we've disbanded hundreds of products and hundreds of ideas that we thought were going to be good. When we started going down that chain, we realized, no, that's not going to yield 80% and the, the result's not there. If you can think like that, you're going to think big picture, you're going to move the needle, and you're going to work less. A lot of times, I think entrepreneurship is being glamorized kind of on the internet. You see the hustle and grind, you see the Instagram posts. I kind of follow some of that. It's kind of funny, those types of entrepreneurs. They're like, oh, I'm killing myself. I'm working 24-7. I'm doing all that. Entrepreneurship's hard. Don't get me wrong. You're going to need to work hard. I worked 80, 90-hour weeks sometimes. But because I applied 80-20, today I don't have to do that. You're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to work harder than you ever thought. But you're not going to have to kill yourself. And you shouldn't kill yourself. Life is more than entrepreneurship. Life is more than business. Even if, it is, even if you are like me and you eat, sleep, and breathe it, there's more things to focus on. And 80-20 helps you get there. Lesson number 10, market size matters. This one's pretty important. I was staying at a hotel here last night, and the lady who, the, the clerk who checked me in, she said, oh, you're the speaker. So I don't know how they knew, but she's like, oh, you're the speaker. And I said, yeah. She's like, oh, I was, ex I was expecting somebody like old or something. I'm like, no, oh, I'm 30. So we got talking for a second or two, and she said, I sew Western clothes, cowboy clothes, and I sell to the people of Ephraim. She's like, it's so difficult, though. It's so hard. She's facing a market size matters issue. I said, do you have a website? She's like, no, they're too hard to make. And I said, well, we can help you with that. They're not that hard nowadays. Honestly, any technical question, here's, here's a total side. Any sort of technical question you have, it's not hard anymore. If I ever hear that stupid excuse, I just get so pissed off. Seriously, like, it's not hard to build a website anymore. It's not hard to create a Facebook profile. It's not hard to set up a business. Those are the stupid, silly things that I can do for you in two minutes, and I don't even know how to code. Okay, I didn't tell that to her. I was a little nicer, but telling it to you. <laughs> as soon as she sets up a web, and her, the stuff she's making was pretty cool, by the way. She showed me some pictures of it. Imagine if she had built a website. Instead of the 7,148 people, I Googled it. That's apparently how many people live here. 
Instead of those people that she's trying to sell to, she can now sell to millions of people that like cowboy clothes and western clothes. Market size matters. Matters at fun of the day, too. We're working in a $1.2 billion a year industry. That means $1.2 billion a year is coming in. Kickstarter takes 5% of that. Indiegogo takes 5% of that. They split that 70-30, Kickstarter more. And then we take some of that as well. The industry is not necessarily getting bigger, though. It's kind of reached a plateau for some reason. I don't know why. I think it's the coolest thing ever, but it's kind of doing what it does. It does about 1.2 million every year. The e-commerce world at large is over $1 trillion now. So I'm playing in a space that is very, very small. I'm playing in like Ephraim, Utah, and all of Utah is like what's available if I were in e-commerce. Keep that in mind. If you're building a business, like the lady who was my hotel clerk last night, you're never going to be able to build a very big business. You might as well work for somebody else because your market size just simply isn't there. Lesson number 11, the star principle. I love this one. You want to be the leader in a high growth industry. That's called a star. And that's what Funded Today was. Four or five years ago, crowdfunding looked like this. Anybody ever go to Google Trends and type in like words? If not, do that. Save that, type it in, type in crowdfunding. You'll see what I'm talking about. Go back five years, it looked like this. Look over the last couple years, it looks kind of like this. Just, I don't know, maybe 2 to 5% growth or something. You want to be in an industry that has 10% growth. So the easiest way to know if you're in the right business is to go on Google Trends, type in four or five keywords related to that, see what people are searching. Everybody's on Google nowadays searching. You can see if you're in a high growth industry. If you're in a high growth industry, that's good for everybody. That means it's expanding. That means people are searching about it. People are researching it. And you're going to be in a great place. Right now, we have become a cash cow, which is not a bad thing. It's a good place to be in. We're the industry leader in a slower growth industry. It's not got that 10% growth. And you can be a cash cow forever, really. We need to watch. If we see crowdfunding starting to decline instead of grow up just slowly, we'd want to pivot. We'd want to adapt. And we'd want to change. We constantly make moves that way already. But keep that in mind as you research on your market. The star principle really does matter. In addition to market size mattering, margins matter. No joke, I would probably say 60 to 80% of our clients come to us with a $100 widget. Let's just assume this water bottle costs 100 bucks. That'd be expensive, but let's say it's $100. And let's say it costs $80 to manufacture. That's a problem. Does anybody know why that's a problem? Now you only got $20 left to market it. You want margins of like 50, 60% if you can to start because you never know about unforeseen costs. You never know about changes in, in, the, in the environment. You never know if you'll become a star and then turn to a cash cow. You never know about rising competition. And then we, and, and then like, wow, you charge 25 to 35%. We can't afford that. That's crazy. I'm like, if you can't spend 25 to 35% to acquire new customers, you don't have a business. If you can't spend money to make money, you have a really stupid idea. Put that on a t-shirt or something. Somebody told me that once. Like, that should be on a t-shirt. I don't know. But seriously, create products that have great perceived value so that you can charge premium prices. That's what Apple does. If you look at Apple's financial statements and their balance sheet, different things like that, you'll see that they have 67% margin on some of their phones. Apple, right? You're basically paying them way too much for your phones. But it's a great phone. People like to pay it. And millions every year pay that. That's what you need to do for your products. Because margins matter. And you can kind of see some of the margins of different industries right there. Maybe don't try to do anything in food. Unless you're going to revolutionize the entire industry. <laughs> All right. Lesson number 13. Your greatest competition comes from within. Jet.com was from a guy who sold his first company to Amazon. And his first company, believe it or not, Amazon bought out his first company, which was like soap.com and diapers.com. It was a conglomerate of a bunch of websites. Because they were killing him, they were killing Amazon on price. So what does this guy do? He goes and hurts Amazon again. And now Walmart just barely bought Jet.com for $3 billion. 
And now Amazon's got a behemoth competitor to deal with. Same thing happened with American Express and the Chase Sapphire card, the reserve card. A bunch of executives in American Express were recruited by Chase and they came over and caused a lot of damage to American Express. Keep your people. Try not to lose them. When you have a valuable person, treat them well. Give them good benefits. Give them what they want. It's better to keep them than it is to let them go somewhere else knowing everything that they know, especially your early people. This is a lesson I wish I would have learned because we had some competition that we had to deal with that we would have never had to deal with if I would have realized that lesson sooner. Lesson number 14, the grass isn't greener on the other side. I've got the double-edged sword, two sides of a coin, toothbrush, sometimes I have, think I have the best job in the world and the toilet paper is like, yeah, right. Just because I'm sitting here telling you how amazing everything is, doesn't mean it's that way. There are hundreds of problems I deal with every single day, even though I have a really successful business. And the same thing's true for every picture you see on Facebook and every Photoshop glamorized thing you see on Instagram. Keep that in mind. Don't get discouraged. The grass is not greener on the other side. And if it is greener, it's going to be soggy. You're going to be stepping in it and it's going to get muddy. There's always something wrong, right? Just keep that in mind. Be positive. We have a, we have a core value fund today called Assume the Positive. And we, really, and we really try to do that. We really try to say the grass is the best. The grass is the greenest to fund it today. Our colors are green, for crying out loud. But realize, don't get jealous. Don't get discouraged. Keep persevering and, and, and understand that everybody else is dealing with the same crap you are. doesn't change. This is one of our core values. Lesson number 15. Perspective is a private experience. I love this one. That bottom image is a guy who is looking at an egg and look at the beautiful bird that he is painting. This is an analogy called blind man touch element, touch elephant. Every single person is touching a piece of that elephant and thinking it's something else. One guy is touching the trunk of the elephant and he says, that's a tree trunk. Touching the leg of the elephant, that's a tree trunk. And the other guy is going to touch the trunk and he's like, that's a snake. No one really has the right perspective on things. If you can realize that with your clients and your customers when they're mad, you can deal with them in a really good way. You can be a little less emotional with them. You can understand where they're coming from. When you get cut off in traffic, you can apply this outside of business. Hey, they must be late for something. They must have had a bad day. Their wife must have yelled at them. Perspective is truly a private experience. We try to do that all the time at Funded Today. I really, and I think most of my people can tell you this, Every time they come to me yelling or screaming or whatever problems they have, they know that they can talk to me and I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to condemn them for saying what they say. People can, I, I own the company and they can, any of my 63 people can come to me and ask me and tell me anything and I'll really try to understand where they're coming from. Even if it's completely different than everything I believe. Because their perspective matters and it is truly private just to them. And sometimes what I believe is real, what they believe is real, and the real truth is somewhere in between. If we can find that, both in business and in life, I think everything is going to be a better place. Lesson number 16, you build great wealth by owning businesses. Anybody watch the TV show, The Prophet, Marcus Lomanis? One of my favorite shows. Anybody watch that one? Okay. You guys like it? It's a great show, huh? I love that show. I might actually get to meet him here soon, so. What is, he, he's a billionaire now. All he does is own businesses. You build great wealth by owning businesses. The first business I did became worth millions. The second business I did, very successful. Funded Today, extremely successful. I took the money that I made at Funded Today and I started a real estate investment firm where I do private lending. Pretty successful. I'm trying to create all these businesses just like Marcus Lamontis has done. That other image is Mark Cuban and all the portfolio companies. That, I couldn't even take a screenshot. I went to markcubancompanies.com and that was like as many as I could fit in there. That's how many dang companies he has. If you want to build great wealth, there is no faster and better way to do it than to own a ton of companies. Lesson number 17. When I first wrote my presentation, I didn't put this one in here, but I think it matters because I said entrepreneurship's in the blood. Entrepreneurship is largely salesmanship and negotiation. It really does matter. If you're not a salesperson, I mean, you don't have to be the biggest extrovert. Believe it or not, I'm probably more like a, a middle ground. Even though I'm up here talking, I'm terrified most of the time. I'm more introverted. So you don't have to be completely extroverted, in your face, used car salesman type. You've got to be a salesman, though. You have to believe in your idea. You have to convince people through great writing, 
through persuasive communication. If you can't do that, you're going to struggle, even with the best ideas, because you are always convincing people. Our website convinces people to hire us. When we communicate with people on Skype, we're, we're helping them understand the best that we can do for them. And you don't have to do this shady. You don't have to do it dishonestly. You can do everything as honest and transparent as possible and feel completely good with what you're doing. If you feel any disconnect or friction, you're doing something wrong. But you absolutely have to sell. If you don't believe in what you're doing, why the heck are you even doing it? Entrepreneurship largely sells in negotiation. And when you're talking with your team, sometimes the numbers look like that. So what does the guy do? He twists the sales thing. He's like, hey, you look at it this way, it's not so bad. Sometimes you have to do that, right? The whole perspective thing too. Sometimes things just aren't good and you've got to convince everybody that they're going to get better. This one's pretty simple and it's kind of negative, but I want to talk about it because I, I love to do good charitable things and I think it matters nowadays. I think we really should be trying to do more good and do better things for the world. But don't start with the idea of a charity. Create something amazing. Then take the profits from that and do whatever you want. Bill Gates is a great example of that. He's 100% full-time. Microsoft's asked him to come back like 10 times. He doesn't come back. He does his Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation full-time because he made billions of dollars selling Microsoft that millions of people use. Facebook's the same way. Google's the same way. They're doing all kinds of amazing things with technology in third world countries. I don't know if one day, maybe 20, 30 years from now, that's going to realize a profit, but it's losing them millions, if not billions of dollars now. But it's okay. They're doing really good and they want to be doing good. And they're making that money from Google search, Facebook paid advertising, Microsoft. First, create a great company. Then when you have a great company, absolutely add a charitable arm to it. Absolutely add a charitable element to it. Create something people want. And then you can do whatever you want with charity and you can be 100% involved in that. And the reason I say that is because we've tried hundreds of campaigns and nobody gives to charity. I mean, with the, with the exception of that ice bucket challenge, which went viral a few years ago, you don't really see a lot of like charitable giving unless there's something really terrible that happens or, or things like that. And that's just because humans are in, inherently selfish. Cater to their selfish notions, make a bunch of money, and then you can be charitable. Lesson number 19, your role as an entrepreneur changes over time. Number one, learn how to get to revenue fast. I tried to like ask myself, if I were in your shoes, what would I try to teach? If I didn't go and acquire money, if I didn't get VC angel investing, here's what I would say. Get to revenue fast. Ask yourself this question. Did I make any money today? Was I profitable? And if you were, great. Do more of that. Duplicate it. Create the system. Grow that revenue. And then when you've done it a bunch of times and you figure out it works, build a team and learn to let go. That's what we've done in fun today. It hurts. You're letting go of your baby. You're letting somebody else do it. Nobody can do it better than me, though. Not true. We have a lot of people funded today that sell better than me, that negotiate better than me, that run paid media better than me, that do email marketing better than me, that do affiliate marketing better than me, that network better than me. They're all better than me now because now they are specialized in the skills that I used to do all by myself, that Thomas used to do all by himself. Letting go hurts. It's hard. But as soon as you let go, that's where the real big profits come in. And finally, design and improve those processes. Designing is that first part. Here's what I did. Here's how I do it. Here's a video showing how I do it. That's the design. Showing somebody else how to do it. And then improving the processes. Every single day, it seems, at least weekly, and for sure quarterly, at our quarterly meetings, we're saying, how are our processes? How are our systems? What are we doing? How can we make them better? And we're improving upon the, those systems, templates, and processes that got us to where we're going, got us to where we, we've got so that we can get to where we're going. And then, like I talked about, if you want to be a serial entrepreneur, it doesn't stop with one venture. So apply those same pra practices to number five, build new ventures, invest the capital. This one I don't want to talk on too much because it's a whole presentation in and of itself, but this is an internal thing we think about at Funded today. SLCRR doesn't really even, it's not even that great of an acronym. I guess you could think SLC, it's all like city or something. But ask yourself these questions. Take a picture of that slide. You can get my slides too. I tweeted them out or they're on SlideShare. But these are how to think big picture. These are how to think on your, on your business. Work on your business instead of in your business. These, these help you make the big decisions instead of talking with a client. How can I get somebody else to talk with that client? A quick example just to show you how to apply it. How can we increase repeat clients? This is actually called the Roosport 2.0 because there was technically a 1.0 rendition before that didn't really do much. So I realized just a couple days ago, why aren't we having everybody do a 2.0? How come our 2,000 plus clients we're working with, why don't we say, hey, why don't you do a 2.0? Because a lot of them are inventing all kinds of new things, but they're not iterating 
on their 1.0 and just making it slightly different, slightly better, just like the Bruce Fort did. That's the second R. How can we increase repeat clients? Hey, Timo of Spine Gym, remember how we raised you 1.5 million for Spine Gym? How about you make the Spine Gym a little bit different? Make it a travel version. Let's call it the Spine Gym 2.0. Can we launch that February 2018? Heck yeah, let's do it. Now we can do that with 100 clients. If we do it with 100 clients and we only raise 30,000 bucks, that's $3 million in additional revenue. 35% is a million bucks we make. Think like that. SLCRR. Lesson number 21, entrepreneurship has the greatest risk to return of anything you'll ever undertake. I don't really ever like to make anything about money because once you have it, it kind of doesn't do much. There's some stat out there, I think if you make 70, 80 grand a year, anything beyond that doesn't really affect you too much mentally, emotionally, really financially, you get to that point. I mean, you can be like Mike Tyson and live those elaborate lifestyles and eventually go broke. But if you're pretty conservative in principle, it doesn't matter. But from a financial standpoint, my various businesses this year will do $20 million. And my net profit on all of that, the part that I'll literally have land in my checking accounts, five million bucks. At a median income of fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, that's 83.33 years at 60,000 that I will make this year. That puts me 84 years ahead of somebody making $60,000 a year financially. You can make a ton of money and there's no better way to do it and there's no better way to make an impact than there is with entrepreneurship. And finally, just a couple, couple small points. Because once you get to the money, it's not about the money anymore. So what do you do? This is kind of where I've been at. And this is where I've spent the last couple of years like seeking and searching and trying to figure things out. I love this quote from Richard Branson. Explore this next great frontier where the boundaries between work and higher purpose are merging into one. Where doing good really is good for business. So now you can create great businesses. Now you can do great things and have a good business in the process. And finally, Steve Jobs, who's kind of transform the world we live in. I love this quote, and this is kind of what I want to end on. When you grow up, you tend to get told the world is the way it is, and your life is just to live your life inside that world. Try not to bash in the walls too much. Try to have a nice family, have fun, save a little money. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you, and you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people can use. And once you learn that, you'll really never be the same again. Entrepreneurship's in the blood. James Allen said, whatever your present environment is, you will rise, fall, or remain with your thoughts, your vision, your ideal. You will become as small as your controlling desire, as great as your dominant aspiration. Go create something. Go do something. And go change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. He's put a link to...